I'm standing here today with deficits, invisible deficits, as a result of my brainstem stroke. So I struggle with cognitive thinking and short-term memory loss and even trouble breathing from my tracheotomy. I'm sure that many of you know that a stroke can happen to anyone at any age, at any point in their life. I was 32. Many people believe that when someone survives a stroke, they may never be the same again. And I'm not. Many people thought that whatever I recovered within the first four months would be as good as it gets for me. And it wasn't. And many people think that I should just be happy with the extent of my recovery and I should just relax now. But I can't. Many people didn't think that I could ever be standing here on this stage today. And I am. So why are we so susceptible to the opinions of other people? When I had my stroke, I developed a rare syndrome, locked-in syndrome. What that means is that I was awake and aware. However, I was no longer able to communicate with the outside world. See, things were coming in, but I couldn't express that they were. I was essentially locked in my own body, and I couldn't communicate with the outside world. I could hear my doctors analyze my condition and discuss how I had a less than 1% chance to recover. And still, no matter how much I tried, I could not respond. See, things were coming in, but I couldn't express that they were. I was trapped and living inside of this real life nightmare. But this was no nightmare. This was my hard reality. But I'll tell you what was really hard. What was really hard was listening to my doctors discuss how they were going to break this news to my mom. See, what I remember most is my mom sitting next to me by my hospital bed all day, every day. My mom never gave up hope in my recovery. She had such a strong belief in my willpower that honestly, I had to borrow her hope until I was able to hope myself. See, my mom never asked me to recover. She just believed that I would. And she spoke to me as if my healing was inevitable. So inevitable that I began to see it too. I started to believe that it was possible for me to find the combination to finally free myself from being locked in my body. See, my mom didn't care that the doctors gave me less than 1% chance to recover or that there were globally less than five cases of locked-in syndrome reported each year. And even less than half of us are lucky enough to be diagnosed. No, she just sat next to my bed and had many one-sided conversations with me. She even played audiobooks to entertain me while I laid there unresponsive. There was this certain audiobook that she would play for me that really, really resonated with me. And it was a book about the power of belief and how to change our thoughts to change our outcomes. Change my thoughts to change my outcomes. That's where all I had at this point, remember? So now I was thinking, it's true. What if I can change my thoughts? Can I change my life, my circumstances, my odds of recovery? Is it that simple? Simple, maybe, but certainly not easy. Okay, I'll try it. What do I have to lose, right? I set my intentions for healing my body, and I waited. And waited. 
and waited. And do you know what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Because you see, intention without action will remain just a thought. So how do we make our thoughts become things? Well, we have to activate them. We have to align our thoughts with the reality that we want to create in this world. So now, I wasn't only thinking of healing my body, but I was embodying my healing. I was activating my recovery by releasing any negative limiting belief that I still had. Basically, I started dreaming. I began to paint vivid pictures in my mind of what I wanted to create. And not just my healing and recovery, but also, what would it feel like? What would it look like? What would I do? What would I say? How will I live? I played this movie in my mind all day, every day. I created a new identity, and I was getting so excited for my recovery because I knew it was inevitable. I had no, absolutely no doubt in my ability. See, on the inside, I had no doubt. But on the outside, I was still lying lifeless in my hospital bed. But nevertheless, I still kept trying to make that connection, to show my family a sign that I was still in my body, to not give up on me, to not believe the odds or the statistics. <laughs> And then one day, someone finally noticed. My mom. My mom noticed my pinky move. Did you just move? Did you just move your pinky? I made my pinky move, and she noticed. Oh my God. Oh my God. Do that again. I did it again. Oh my God, can you hear me? I moved my pinky again. Yes, yes, you can hear me. She ran to tell the doctor she was so excited. My daughter's moving. She's moving. She's moving on command. But the doctors, they quickly disregarded her excitement. I'm sorry, ma'am. I know you want to believe it, but those movements are involuntary. How many times does that happen to all of us? Where we work and work and work so hard for our efforts to finally be noticed, only for them to be completely disregarded. So what do we do at this point? Do we just give up, do we throw in the towel, or do we keep trying? And fortunately, my mother didn't stop it, no. And if you know anything about Latin mamas, you don't tell them. Okay, so now, the first time I was sharing my pinky movement with my mom, there was no pressure to perform. But now, the pressure was on. The doctors were all standing around my bed, and honestly, I could feel their low expectations. And feeling that doubt was not what I needed to make that connection again. Because honestly, I was so tired now. Imagine, it was like an energy beam coming from my brain, passing the barricade at my brain stem, traveling down through my arm, passing my elbow, and now stalling at my wrist. Similar to when we have a lot of windows open on our computer and we're trying to get things done with a sense of urgency, and then we get that little annoying spinning wheel, and now we gotta wait. Yeah, that was happening for me in this moment. I was stalling. She's not doing it, one of my neurologists said. But the other, the other had a little more hope. He said, no, 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 give her more time. I think she's trying. Her face just changed. Well, after hearing his belief in me, it reminded me to keep trying. See, when you couple the belief that other people have in you with the belief that you have in yourself, something extraordinary happens. And then, bam, I made that connection. I made my pinky move again. And this time it was on command. And I did it over and over and over again. My doctor saw it. My nurses saw it. My family saw it. 
Hope was restored with a tiny pinky move. And no, I didn't just get up and walk out of the hospital after that. In fact, I never walked out of the hospital. I was wheeled out. And then months later, I made another pinky move when I learned how to walk with a walker. And then a cane. And eventually, I was walking unassisted. And all of those micro victories were all celebrated. And they all stemmed from that tiny pinky move. See, there is power behind a micro move. And a pinky move is just a micro move in the direction of your goals that will ultimately lead you to massive success. So the rest of my recovery was a series of more pinky moves that compounded for me to be able to be standing here today. See, some of us won't even attempt to climb any mountain of uncertainty because it looks too big, too scary, not probable. But I'm not just here to share my story with you. I'm here to remind you that you are limitless. And I'm not just saying that because that's the title of my book. I really, really believe it. You are limitless. And I'm inviting you to look at whatever challenge that you may be faced with right now and just know that you don't have to have it all figured out. But you can start by making pinky moves. Thank you.